wrestling fans, I am the pro wrestle machine. And this is July 8, 1996 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Warrior WW relationship falls apart. Olympics and pro wrestling. Rikido's a memorial. Tons more. By Observer Staff. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228. July 8, 1996. The future of Jim Helwig, Ultimate Warrior, in the World Wrestling Federation is again in question after his missing several weekend house shows and the death of his father. Helwig's father, Tom Helwig, who he had been estranged from since the age of three and had been living in South Florida, passed away on June 30th. Helwig didn't appear for any of his scheduled dates after working television on June 25 in La Crosse, Pennsylvania. At the house show in Indianapolis on June 28, it was announced he wasn't there due to transportation problems. While on tour on June 29 in Detroit, the wrestlers were given the word that Helwig was through, either he had quit or was fired, nobody was really sure, which is basically the same thing except in this specific wartime situation, there is a huge distinction. If Helwig were to quit, he would be unable to work for WCW for the remainder of his contract which is believed to have about 14 months left. If he was strictly fired, he could work anywhere he wanted immediately after termination although WWF could suspend him for a while before firing him similar to what WCW did with Vader, putting him on ice for a period of time to keep him from going to WCW. Realistically except for a one-shot curiosity deal, WCW would be totally insane to want him anyway because of the inherent problems. Bret Hart was called that morning and told that they were tired of Helwig's constant demands and wanted him for emergency duty, to work Detroit and Pittsburgh to make up for Helwig not being there. For whatever reason, Hart didn't come back. A call was then made to Sid Aoudi, who has been out of action for months, and he was brought in as a babyface replacement. In both Detroit and Pittsburgh, ring announcer Bill Dunn announced that Warrior wouldn't be there because he refuses to wrestle in a city like, fill in the blank, basically turning him heel and burying him. They offered refunds in both cities, and reportedly a few dozen did take them in both cities. They said he would be replaced by the craziest wrestler in the WWF but didn't mention the name. Later in the show, as there were a flock of run-ins during the Shawn Michaels vs. Vader title match, with four heels Vader, Bulldog, Owen Hart and Goldust, fighting two faces, Michaels and Ahmed Johnson, Sid came out to a huge pop and chased the heels away. Later in the show, he beat Owen Hart with a powerbomb in 41 seconds. The same basic scenario took place the next night in Pittsburgh. Reports are that Sid was bigger than ever before and as cut as ever to boot. It is not known exactly what caused the latest Vince McMahon-Jim Helwig situation, although this has been a constant situation between the two with Helwig's constant demands which has led to him being fired from the WWF on two occasions in the past, his threats to walk out which have led to him getting huge payoffs to return for pay-per-view shows, his never arriving in December after an agreement to come in, and the two having problems once again in the days leading to a WrestleMania which was built around his return, not to mention all his problems in dealing with promoters in Europe and his walking out on his own promotion in Las Vegas the day before the show after leaving with several sponsorship checks. According to one company source, it was a problem having to do with a marketing dispute, and reports elsewhere stated it was that Helwig found out about something with his likeness being merchandised that he didn't know about, got mad about it and wanted to make changes in his deal. The gossip among the wrestlers was that he was unhappy with his WrestleMania payoff. Helwig legitimately earned $550,000 at WrestleMania 7, and may have earned more the prior year for his match with Hulk Hogan. At one point in 1992 he held McMahon up before a Survivor Series event, refusing to wrestle unless he received $1 million per pay-per-view event. According to a lawsuit filed and then dropped, McMahon agreed to that figure, however Helwig was fired before the show took place. The story got even crazier, as Helwig had a blow-up at the office before the weekend, but by Sunday it was known he was wanting to return and had phone conversations with McMahon after no showing the week, however at no point was anyone aware of a death in the family. Helwig did an online interview on July 1st, he said that his father had died and claimed that was why he missed the shows, that he couldn't understand why he was buried in that manner at the house shows or why on the company 900 line tees on Raw they said he was in the dog house and to call and find out why. Helwig said he would return on July 11th in Albany, New York, which is his next scheduled booking. He had this coming weekend off to appear at a comic book convention. If Helwig's story was the case entirely, there would have been no problem and there certainly was a major problem all week. As of press time, WWF marketing officials had been told no decision as to Helwig's future had been reached but a decision would be made in the coming days, definitely by Monday. 
WWF officials had made a decision over the weekend, when it was not known about the death and the decision was leaning toward getting rid of him, not to announce the status of Hellwig either way because it would screw up the pay-per-view angles and outdate the July 8th Raw show built around an Ultimate Warrior vs. Owen Hart match which ends with Warrior beating laid out by Team Cornette, which would be a natural way to end his tenure in the WWF should that be the case, similar to what WCW did after the Sid Vicious Arnold Anderson stabbing incident in 1993 that they kept Sid's name alive on television until a previously taped angle where he was laid out, and then portrayed it as him being seriously injured and he was never seen in the promotion again. At the Raw tapings, Warrior's strong comeback from the beating was taped for the July 15th Raw, but if Warrior wasn't to return, the storyline likely would be that he was injured on July 8th, and the comeback on July 15th would be edited out of the show. We're told whatever decision the WWF makes regarding Hellwig will be made apparent while watching the July 8th Raw show. If Hellwig is gone, and given the circumstances and timing, the odds would seem to be against that being the case, then either Sid or more likely Yokozuna, since there is no time to tape an angle for television involving Sid, while Yokozuna is already built into the storyline with a natural program against all three, would take Hellwig's place in the pay-per-view main event teaming with Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson vs. Vader and Hart and Bulldog. Hellwig's no-show immediately fueled rumors of him being the third man on the Kevin Nash and Scott Hall team, but based on what we've been told, WCW had decided on the third man and it wasn't Hellwig. Even if WWF were to fire him, it wouldn't do so until after the WCW pay-per-view event anyway, so it's pretty much considered a legal impossibility, more so now than ever with a lawsuit out, that Hellwig would be in the Daytona Beach match. A McMahon slash Hellwig breakup would be even messier this time than in the past with their business partnership in both the comic book and the wrestling school in Phoenix having to be sorted out. With the Olympic Games just a few weeks away, there is a lot of wrestling history, much of it largely unknown or long forgotten, when it comes to a connection between the Olympic Games and pro wrestling. Numerous Olympic wrestlers in the heavier weight divisions and even a few in lighter weight divisions went on to pro wrestling. Most in the amateur sport of wrestling look down on pro wrestling because it's a work would call it cashing in their reputation, but others would see it not at all different from ex-football players that can't act going into Hollywood. Nobody needs to talk about the differences between amateur wrestling at the top level and pro wrestling at any level, so it should come as no surprise that the transition in many cases hasn't been smooth. Does anyone remember the pro wrestling careers of people like Anton Giesink or Evan Johnson? Others ex-Olympians had long pro wrestling careers, but they wouldn't have been necessarily noteworthy, such as Dale Lewis or Brad Reingans. In some cases, there are men who use their amateur and Olympic fame as a springboard to win major world titles in the pro game, such as Dick Hutton, Ed Don George and Khosrau Iron Sheik Vaziri. In a few cases, ex-Olympic wrestlers like Vern Gagne, Danny Hodge, Carl Istaz aka Carl Gotch, Mitsuo Yoshida aka Ricky Choshu, Masa Saito and Tomomi Jumbo Tsurida became legitimate legends of the pro wrestling game. And one former Olympic wrestler, Hiroshi Hazi, not only became in his prime one of the five best workers in the world and a booker for one of the biggest wrestling companies around, but took the fame he gained from both pro and amateur wrestling and the reputation of helping book a major company all the way to the Japanese Senate, which he is currently serving in. When the Gold Dust Trio and now you know where that name came from, Tutsmont Billy Sandow, and Ed Strangler Lewis basically ran pro wrestling in the 1920s, it was natural that many of the top amateurs of that era would break in. Lewis and Mott were both the real deal when it came to wrestling. Some consider them two of the best shooters ever. If you've ever noticed about territories in the past that were run by wrestlers, they generally favor performers like themselves. That's why you'd always find a plethora of former area wrestlers and football players working for Vern Gagne, while you'd always find a territory filled with small men who were willing to bleed working for Jerry Jarrett, or big ex-college football linemen who had some wrestling ability working for Bill Watts. I want to credit Mike Chapman's Encyclopedia of American Wrestling, which is by far the best reference book I've ever seen on the subject of amateur wrestling in the United States, and has a chapter on amateur stars who went on to pro wrestling, for much of the historical information on long-forgotten wrestlers from previous generations. The first U.S. Olympic team wrestlers to make the transition to pro wrestling were 1924 Olympic gold medalists Robin Reed and Russell Viss. Reed, like Danny Hodge a generation later, was a phenom, as even though he competed at 134 pounds, he was the dominant wrestler of his era in any weight. Several of the leading amateur wrestling authorities to this day still consider Reed as the toughest American wrestler ever. As an amateur, Reed never lost a match at any level of competition. As astounding as that statement is, it's even more impressive when one considers that to prove his point in 1924, even though his competition weight was 134, 
he entered the regional Olympic trials in four different weight divisions on the same day, 145, 158, 174 and 191s, winning all four. While training for the Olympics, it was well known that he was able to pin every member of the 1924 U.S. team, including the heavyweight. Reed wrestled professionally for about 10 years, but due to his size, was never a major pro star. This won a gold medal at 145 pounds and wrestled for several years, but also wasn't a major star and never really enjoyed pro wrestling because, in his own words, he was a lousy showman. However, a major pro star came out of the 1928 Olympics, Ed Don George, a former collegiate champion who placed fourth in the heavyweight division. It wasn't long before he claimed the Pro Wrestling World Heavyweight Championship, beating Gus Sonnenberg on December 10, 1930. That title switch is a story in itself. Sonnenberg was a national football hero at Dartmouth, who went into pro wrestling and became a huge drawing card immediately for Boston promoter Paul Bowser. By this time, the Gold Dust Trio had their inevitable split with Lewis and Sandow remaining together, and Mont going to New York using Jim Londos as his top attraction, each with their own title. Lewis dropped his world title to Sonnenberg in Boston, basically bringing Sonnenberg's promoter, Bowser, into national power, and the two went on the road playing to big houses. As is the historical norm in wrestling, a nasty promotional war got even nastier. Mont would continually have his top stars, Londos and Dick Chicot, who were both real wrestlers, go on the road and make the grandstand challenges to Sonnenberg to matches that weren't going to happen. He even booked one of his own wrestlers under the ring name Gus Sonnenberg in states that didn't regulate wrestling and made him a jobber. The pressure got bad on Lewis and Sandow even though they were making big money with Sonnenberg on top, because some of the fans began to think of Sonnenberg as a chicken for avoiding the vocal top challenges. Finally, in Mont's coup de grace, Londos arranged for a friend of his, a top-flight 160-pound wrestler who had no name value, to confront Sonnenberg on a busy street in Los Angeles, gouge his eyes, and beat him up in front of witnesses. The publicity spread nationwide about the world heavyweight wrestling champion and a famous football hero being beaten up in front of numerous witnesses by a little guy. With all the embarrassment that resulted from that, Bowser, apparently without consulting either Sandow or Lewis, immediately put the title on Ed Don George, because he felt after that incident he needed the title on someone who was a feared wrestler. The title split in numerous directions after that, but George, who dropped the title to Lewis, wound up winning Bowser's version of the title, which eventually became the first version of the AWA title generally recognized in New England and Eastern Canada, on two more occasions in the 30s. George's first title win was historical a lot more than it being the first Olympic wrestler to claim a world heavyweight title, but because it signaled the beginning of the end of national dominance for Lewis and Sandow as promoters since they no longer control the major world title. However, George was not the biggest pro wrestling star to come out of the 1928 Olympic Games, Earl McCready of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan had been recruited by Oklahoma A&M, now Oklahoma State, and wrestling as a heavyweight, became the first man in history to win three NCAA titles from 1928 to 1930. He never lost in college winning every match but three via pin, making him the greatest pinner in American college wrestling history, a record that brought him all the way to the U.S. National Wrestling Hall of Fame. In 1928 he represented Canada as a heavyweight in the Olympics, as a pro wrestler, McCready went all over the world for more than three decades, gaining great fame in England and Australia, and was a particularly huge star in Western Canada for Stu Hart, as one of the most well-respected wrestlers of his era. McCready's signature move was the rolling cradle, a move generally forgotten in American wrestling but one of the signature spots of Manami Toyota. In 1932, the U.S. team had more success, capturing three gold medals in Los Angeles, Bobby Pierce at 123, Jack Van Bebert at 158 and Pete Maringer at 191. Like Reed and Viss, all went into pro wrestling and none made a major mark. Maringer, who did get a title match against Lewis during his short pro career, and always maintained he could have beaten Lewis in a shoot, became more well-known as a pro football player. In fact, during his era, Maringer's football-slash-wrestling double success at Kansas was so respected that in a 1950 poll, he was voted one of the 10 greatest amateur athletes of the first half century. Due to World War II, the Olympics were suspended in 1940 and 1944. It wasn't until 1948 that the Olympics resumed, and that competition in London ended up producing four of the next generation's biggest pro stars. Ironically, none of them meddled in the Olympics itself, however few pro wrestling aficionados of the 50s and 60s and many even into the 70s wouldn't immediately recognize the names of Vern Gagne, Carl Gotch, Mad Dog Vachon, 
and Dick Hutton. Ganya actually never competed in the Olympics, as 1948 was the only year that the U.S. team included two members in every weight division, rather than one, however only one would be able to compete. Another excellent amateur who was a longtime pro although not nearly as big a name in pro wrestling, Joe Scarpello was on that same team as an alternate at 174 pounds. Ganya lost in the wrestle-offs for the 191 to Henry Wittenberg, who won the gold medal. Glenn Brand, who took the gold at 174, winning every match easily beat Scarpello in a close match at the wrestle-offs. Wittenberg was the original trainer for Larry Simon, who was better known as the Great Malenko. Ganya's exploits in pro wrestling, both as a wrestler and as a promoter, both positive and negative, would be worthy of an entire issue and perhaps a book. He became an immediate superstar in pro wrestling during the days when pro wrestling was a staple on network primetime television on the old Dumont network, as the prototypical clean-cut local jock scientific wrestler. After just a few years in, Ganya was one of the country's first wrestlers ever to earn $100,000 in a year, which to show how times change, was more than any baseball, football, basketball or hockey player was earning in those days. He wound up as one of the most powerful promoters in the world from the early 60s through the late 80s. He made numerous enemies along the way and was among the most hated promoters in many circles in the entire industry. Ganya held the AWA title 10 times from its inception largely as a title created to make himself the world heavyweight champion in the Midwest and kept himself in the same role as top babyface and the champion or leading title contender until his first retirement in 1981 at which point he was 55 years old. He made several comebacks into his early 60s and promoted his AWA through 1991, although it floundered in its last several years when it fell victim to the more modern competition. Carl Estaz of Belgium, who placed eighth at heavyweight, later became Carl Gotch, taking his last name after Frank Gotch, the most famous of all American pro wrestlers of the first half of the century. He had success and was respected and feared worldwide, and was widely believed to have been ultimate fighting champion, as he was a real master of submissions, during a day when no such competition existed. But he also had a reputation in the United States as being someone who couldn't draw, so in many territories wasn't pushed hard. Gotch became legendary in Japan, and was later nicknamed the God of Professional Wrestling, and continued to wrestle in Japan as a headliner until 1982, at which point he was 57 years old and still looked impressive. Even at that late date he remained with a legendary reputation as a shooter, once turning another Olympic wrestler, Ricky Chashu, who was 27 years his junior, inside out in a workout when Chashu got a little cocky. Even as late as the mid-80s the reputation was that nobody could beat him in a straight shoot, Gotch was the original trainer of many of today's Japanese superstars such as Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Akira Meita, and Nobuiko Takada, and later was affiliated with both the first and second incarnations of the UWF as a trainer. Dick Hutton, who was considered a gold medal possibility, went into the Olympics with a severe elbow injury and wound up up placing sixth as a heavyweight. Many feel he was the best in the world at that time, having won three NCAA titles, losing in his quest for a fourth title by a referee's decision after a legendary double overtime match against Ganya in the 1949 finals. While not a top draw in pro wrestling, he did hold the NWA heavyweight title, at the time the most widely recognized title in the game, from 1957, beating Luthez in Toronto, until losing to Pat O'Connor in 1959. Hutton's place in history was largely created by Thez, a longtime champ who had a falling out with the NWA over wanting to tour internationally. The NWA didn't want to go without a champion for any period of time, so Thez agreed to drop the title. The first pick was Buddy Rogers, but Thez refused to drop the title to Rogers based on personal animosity. Thez in his entire career never did a job for Rogers, but agreed to lose to the NWA's second choice, Hutton, since he respected him as the best mat wrestler of the era. Hutton, like Bob Backlund a generation later, was not very colorful even though he was a great athlete. Unlike Backlund, he wasn't a great draw either. After losing the title, he quickly faded from main events and within a few years was out of pro wrestling completely. Maurice Rashawn, who represented Canada at 174 pounds, became another legendary pro wrestler and tough guy, and was the first member of a famed wrestling dynasty which included brother Paul Butcher Vachon and sister the late Vivian Vachon and niece Gertrude Luna Vachon. Mad Dog held the AW World title five times in the 1960s, the tag title with his brother and remained a big drawing card in pro wrestling due to his crazy man gimmick and guttural interviews nearly 20 years past his prime. His 36-year pro career ended after leaving the AWA for the WWF in 1984, where at his age, having to get over in new parts of the country wasn't going to happen and he quickly faded from the scene having burned his AWA bridge behind him. He was still working occasional independence when, 
while walking alongside a road, was hit by a car and suffered injuries so severe it resulted in his leg being amputated. The only amateur wrestler ever to make the cover of Sports Illustrated, perhaps the greatest American wrestler ever and probably one of the most underrated athletes of all time, Danny Hodge burst on the international scene in 1952 in Helsinki, Finland, making the Olympic team at 174 pounds, placing fifth. What was noteworthy about that was the Olympics he was competing in were taking place just after he had finished his junior year of high school, an unprecedented feat. Hodge's unbelievable athletic exploits have been written up here many times. He was not only unbeaten in three years of college wrestling at the University of Oklahoma, breezing to three NCAA titles, but was never even taken down during his entire college career. His pin percentage in college is second as the greatest in the history of American collegiate wrestling. He's the only man in history ever to win national amateur championships in both boxing and wrestling, capturing the national amateur title in boxing in 1959 two years after first putting on a pair of boxing gloves. During a 10-day period while a junior in college, he won the NCAA tournament and the AU Greco-Roman and freestyle tournaments winning every match via pinfall. He dominated every match in the 1956 Olympics until the gold medal match, where he was leading 8-1 against the defending champion from Bulgaria, when a very controversial pin was called against him he had to settle for the silver medal. During his international amateur career between the ages of 18 to 23, he only lost three matches, all at the international level, all to people who had won gold medals. College Wrestling's Wrestler of the Year award is named after him. Hodge was also skilled in submissions, had an human grip strength along with both boxing and wrestling skill, and few doubt he was another person who would have cleaned up had there been a UFC in those days. After trying pro boxing for two years, Hodge turned to pro wrestling in 1959 and was one of Leroy McGurk's two biggest drawing cards and the dominant junior heavyweight in the world, holding the NWA junior heavyweight title, which at the time was recognized worldwide, seven times from 1960 through his retirement due to breaking his neck in an auto accident in 1976. Because he was a legend in Oklahoma from his legitimate exploits and for his strength demonstrations of breaking pliers with his bare hands, Hodge was along with Bill Watts, his area's top babyface for most of his career. However, due to a lack of charisma and being on the small side, he was never a major star anywhere else except in Japan. Hawaiian Harold Sakata represented the U.S. in weightlifting as a light heavyweight in the 1952 Olympics. Shortly after the Olympics, he embarked on a pro wrestling career that, on and off, lasted about 20 years under the name Ajab Tosh Togo. Sakata's pro wrestling career was secondary to his career as an actor. His most famous role was as Ajab, the heel karate killer with the magic hat in a famous James Bond movie Goldfinger, and much of his wrestling push as mainly a mid-level performer was based on him being the real-life Ajab. In the late 60s he was in a cough medicine commercial that was probably the most famous television commercial in the United States at the time, where he played a Herculean Japanese karate man whose vicious cough kept him karate chopping everything in sight and making a mess of his house breaking all the tables and chairs in two, before they got the cough medicine in his mouth and he was immediately calmed and soothed. Dale Lewis represented the U.S. in Greco-Roman wrestling and as a heavyweight in 1956 and 1960, losing his second round match both times. Lewis who also wrestled at the University of Oklahoma, wrestled as a pro for about 15 years, through the late 70s, most notably as Professor Dale Lewis. He was a named wrestler, but by no means a major star. The most interesting trivia item regarding Lewis to today's pro wrestling fans is that he was the heavyweight at Oklahoma at the same time Bill Watts went to the college, and since Watts was never in his league as a wrestler, Watts could never break onto the varsity team. The 1964 Olympic Games produced the first of this era's major stars Masanori Saito of Japan. Saito was considered the best heavyweight his country had ever produced breezing to both the national freestyle and Greco-Roman titles in 1963, and the Olympics were on his home turf in Tokyo so he had the potential to become a legitimate national hero. However, he wound up settling for a sixth-place finish. Saito is still active today, one month from his 54th birthday both in a wrestling and office capacity after a pro career that started in 1965 and has taken him all over the world as a major star, including winning the AWA title in the dying days of that company, and participating in the legendary first jungle death match against Antonio Inoki. Japan's Greco-Roman representative in the heavyweight division was Yoshihiro Sugiyama, who didn't place. As Thunder Sugiyama, he was a name wrestler but never a superstar. He debuted in 1965 and wrestled for 13 years, with Isao Yoshihara's Trans World Wrestling Association and later for his international wrestling enterprises. Sugiyama held the Iwe's international title, which was its major singles belt, for 10 months, beating Billy Robinson in 1970 and losing to Big Bill Miller in 1971, 
so for that period would have been the top star for the number three promotion in the country. He faded from the top after that point and wasn't heavily pushed as the decade wore on. Robert Roop, who became better known as Bob Roop, represented the U.S. in the 1968 Olympics as a heavyweight, placing seventh. He wrestled from 1969 through 1987, with his best success coming in Florida. While he was a genuine star in pro wrestling, he never achieved the level of success people were predicting for him in 1971 when he was sent to Madison Square Garden and was considered the most promising young wrestler in the country. At that point, it was considered almost a given that he'd eventually be NWA or WWWF World Heavyweight Champion. His base success as a box office draw was in a 1977 feud with a young babyface named Kevin Sullivan in San Francisco where the two had the best drawing series of houses at the Cow Palace in more than a decade. However, in what appeared to be the middle of the run, both Roop and Sullivan were fired by Roy Shire, allegedly for trying to steal the territory from him. By the end of his career, he had shaved off the hair of half of his head, shades of John Tenta, and teamed with Sullivan and Asmaya Singh. A contemporary of Roop's in those Olympics, Hossein Khosrau Vaziri, better known nowadays as the Iron Sheik, represented Iran in Greco Roman at 177 pounds and was eliminated after losing in the second round. Vaziri later helped coach the U.S. Greco Roman team in both 1972 and 1976. It was while coaching in 1972 in Munich that he was discovered by Ganya, who brought him into pro wrestling in a training camp that two other members of the 1972 Olympic team, the mammoth heavyweight wrestler Chris Taylor and the huge weightlifter, Dan Patera. The one-time personal bodyguard for the Shah of Iran in the early 60s when President John F. Kennedy visited the country, Vaziri started pro wrestling at only 185 pounds and he was already in his mid-30s. He was considered a phenom among the wrestlers because of his pure ability and incredible physical conditioning, being compared to Billy Robinson, then considered by many as the best pure wrestler in the game. But his ability and conditioning didn't translate to the public. As a foreign babyface with a clean-cut amateur wrestling background, he was going nowhere until, while touring Japan, he met a sports writer who suggested he use his Arabian heritage and copy the legendary Sheik, and the Iron Sheik was born. As the heel suplex machine, Sheik was a typical anti-American heel who was a star and respected as a good performer, but not a major star until feuding with Sergeant Slaughter in the WWF and being the transitional heel champion in the WWF between Bob Backlund and Hulk Hogan for a few weeks in early 1984 by which time he was already 45 years old. Sheik remained a name in the business through his final major campaign in the WWF as General Mustafa, ironically by then being billed from Iran's hated enemy Iraq, both teaming with and later splitting up with Slaughter when Slaughter did his 1991 Iraqi sympathizer angle that led to him being WWF champion and the controversial WrestleMania match with Hogan. Taylor, who along with Dan Gable became America's first genuine celebrity amateur wrestlers in 1972 in the Munich Olympics that became more legendary for Arab terrorists kidnapping and then murdering 11 Israeli athletes and coaches. Taylor represented the U.S. in both freestyle and Greco-Roman as a heavyweight. At 6 foot 5 and 420 pounds, Taylor was a media darling going into the Olympics. The U.S. hadn't tasted gold in any form of wrestling since 1960, and Gable was an odds-on favorite going in, and he won the gold in dominant fashion and became one of the country's most famous amateur wrestling legends because of it. The U.S. hadn't had a heavyweight gold medalist since 1924, and Taylor went in as the expected silver medalist, but most aficionados felt gold was a possibility. He ended up with a controversial bronze in freestyle. By luck of a bad draw, he faced eventual gold medalist and dominant heavyweight world champion of the era Alexander Medved of the Soviet Union, in the first round. In the most controversial Olympic wrestling decision since Hodge's loss in 1956, Taylor was called for a stalling point in a call considered so bad that official was then suspended from the Olympics. However, the stalling point was the difference as Taylor lost 3-2, and ended up winning the rest of his matches en route to the bronze. He didn't fare as well in Greco-Roman, being eliminated by a legendary over-the-head belly-to-belly suplex by Wilfred Dietrich that became a worldwide best-selling poster in the years that followed, in the second round. Dietrich, who won a silver medal, later wrestled professionally and was a star in Europe during the 70s. Taylor captured two NCAA titles at the University of Iowa and was the greatest heavyweight pinner since McCready. He then signed a four-year contract for a reported $100,000 a year which would be right near the top of what the biggest names in wrestling were earning in those days, with Ganya. He was trained in a famous training camp that included Vaziri, Patera, Greg Ganya, Jim Brunzel and a guy named Richard Morgan Fleer. 
Despite his celebrityhood, ABC's Wide World of Sports even aired one of his early pro matches against Vashon Taylor was a flop as a pro wrestler. His first pro match amidst tons of media publicity drew only 1,200 fans. He lacked mobility, charisma, and personality, and didn't get into the comedy routine that made Haystacks Calhoun a star in the era. His freakish size wasn't as awesome to the public as another newcomer during that time period, Andrei Rusimov. He faded out of pro wrestling after only a few years and died in 1979, at which point his weight exceeded 600 pounds. Patera, on the other hand, dropped 70 pounds from his Olympic weightlifting frame of 330 pounds, bleached his hair, turned heel, and ended up becoming a major star in pro wrestling after placing fourth in the 1972 Olympics as a super heavyweight weightlifter. The first American ever to press 500 pounds overhead, Patera was offered $50,000 per year by Ganya to try pro wrestling. Patera was a very rare individual in that he didn't start pro wrestling until the age of 31, but had a lengthy successful career everywhere he went and turned into a very good worker. He and Saito's wrestling career history intertwined in one memorable incident in 1983. After a match in Waukesha, Wisconsin, the two apparently went to a McDonald's at about 1 a.m. for some food, but the place was closed but there were employees inside that wouldn't open the door. Patera, who was a world-class shot putter before going into weightlifting, threw a boulder through the window of the McDonald's. Later that night, police came to the hotel room where Patera and Saito were. In a famous fight scene, ten Waukesha police officers wound up injured, including one woman officer who had her leg broken by Saito. The end result was both Patera and Saito spent 1985 to 1987 in prison. While both returned, and Saito actually reached his biggest level of stardom in Japan the two years after his return, the two years in prison from the age of 44 to 46 took its toll physically on Patera, who returned to the WWF. Vince McMahon continued to send Patera's family a check while he was in prison, but no longer had the fire and his career as a top name ended shortly thereafter. He wrestled regularly through 1990 and has still done matches from time to time as recently as two months ago. Wilhelm Ruska and Anton Giesink, both from the Netherlands, who each captured the gold medals in judo as heavyweights, both went into pro wrestling. Ruska won two gold medals in 1972, both as a heavyweight in the overall division. He went to New Japan, debuting at the age of 35 on February 2, 1976 in a legendary mix match at Budokan Hall doing a job that helped create the work legend of Inoki as the greatest mixed martial arts fighter in the world. They had several rematches through the late 70s, although none as famous as their first match, with the final one, a nostalgia match coming in September, 1994, with Inoki naturally winning once again. Ruska also wrestled some in the United States, and despite a muscular physique that was ahead of its time, he was not a good worker and was never any kind of an attraction. Desink, who was something like 6 foot 7 and 305 pounds, won the heavyweight gold medal at the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo, which made him more of a celebrity in Japan since he won the gold in a Japanese-created sport on Japanese soil. When Desink started with All Japan Pro Wrestling, it was with incredible fanfare and one of the biggest pushes of all time put at the same level as guys like Jack Briscoe, the destroyer in the funks on the depth chart because of his judo background. His debuted on November 24, 1973, at which time he was already 39 years old, drew a phenomenal television rating teaming with Giant Baba to beat Bruno Sammartino and Cyclone Negro in the main event. However, to put it kindly, he was the pits in the ring, and after a few years, disappeared from the scene. But far bigger than Patera, the 1972 games produced two of Japan's biggest wrestling stars of the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Tomomi Surita represented Japan at 220 pounds in Greco-Roman wrestling in 1972, placing 7. Surita had previously won the national amateur title in his weight in both freestyle and Greco-Roman in 1971. In a pro wrestling career that started with a much heralded debut in March of 1973, Surita is generally considered along with perhaps Jun Akiyama and Owen Hart, ironically both also top amateur wrestlers, as the best rookies of the past three decades. Surita was an instant hit and was one of the biggest push names in the business and top workers from his first match in the ring until a serious case of hepatitis ended his career as a serious performer in 1992, although he still works comedy matches to this day. Mitsuo Yoshida, better known as Riki Chashu, wrestled at 220 pounds for Japan in the freestyle division, being eliminated in the first round. Chashu, in 1982, changed the face of Japanese pro wrestling forever with a feud against Tatsumi Fujinami that began the change in Japan from a sport based on American versus Japanese main events to where the top drawing matches were Japanese versus Japanese and Americans became far less important. 
Chashu was a tremendously charismatic drawing card in the mid-80s and to this day is still one of the most popular and well-known wrestlers in the country. Although past his prime today, Chashu still wrestles for New Japan along with being the real power in charge of the most successful wrestling company in the world over the past several years. By headlining some of the biggest houses in history, he'll be recorded as one of the all-time most influential and biggest draws in history. There were five men from the 1976 Olympic Games that went into pro wrestling, with five different levels of success. Evan Johnson represented the U.S. at 198 pounds in Greco-Roman wrestling, placing seventh. Brad Rygans represented the U.S. in Greco-Roman wrestling, and placed fourth. Buffalo Alan Koaj represented the U.S. in judo as a heavyweight winning a bronze medal, and becoming the first American ever to medal in judo. Klaus Wallace of Austria competed as a heavyweight in judo as well, placing sixth. Johnson wrestled so briefly in 1981 for Ganya that few even remember it. Rangans, a collegiate teammate of Bob Backlund at North Dakota State, also started in 1981 for Ganya and was given a strong push at the beginning, including a feud where he would regularly suplex Jerry Blackwell and getting some heavyweight title matches, but his lack of personality doomed his career in the U.S. He continued to wrestle for New Japan, where he was a mid-level star billed as wrestling supercomputer, through the early 90s, and still works with that company as a liaison in booking foreign talent. Koaj, who was already a legend in the martial arts community in the United States, was trained by New Japan shortly after the Olympics to be another martial artist to put Inoki over. He did so well in training he became a full-time wrestler and despite turning pro at a relatively old age, 35, had a long solid career with both New Japan and particularly for Stu Hart in Western Canada as main event Hill Bad News Allen, holding the North American title four times. He worked for WWF for a time as Bad News Brown. He appeared on one of the UWFI pay-per-view shows in the United States in 1994, but by that time his knees were shot and his mobility gone. Even today, at 54, he still wrestles on occasion in Canada. Wallace, who came back to the 1980 Olympics and won a silver medal, turned pro in 1983 and wrestled for a few years getting a strong immediate push to the top. He was being groomed to be the top star for the CWA in Europe, but before getting to that level, left the wrestling business. The other was a gold medalist heavyweight boxer Leon Spinks, who had a famous boxer versus wrestler embarrassment putting over Inoki in 1987 on one of the most important nights in Japanese wrestling history since it was the night Akira Maeda got over as a mainstream celebrity in a legendary mixed match with Dan Naki and Nielsen. Spinks who briefly held the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship, winning and losing it back to Muhammad Ali, later worked as a wrestler working some shows against the likes of Atsushi Onita several times, Great Wojo and even Jerry Lawler and worked several tours for FMW. Both the United States and Japan boycotted the 1980 Olympics over the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, leaving some of the greatest athletes in the world with their hopes and dreams unfulfilled for a lifetime. Greg Wojciechowski was America's freestyle heavyweight, and later wrestled as the great Wojo mainly for Dick the Bruiser around Indiana. While he was pushed as the top star for the small local promotion for a while, he never made a national name, and may be best known in the mid-80s for doing the grandstand play of having his promoter take out ads during the local WWF broadcasts and issue challenges that were sure to be not answered for straight matches against Hulk Hogan. Rangans who probably would have won a medal, again represented the U.S. in Greco-Roman. Japan's freestyle heavyweight was Yoshiaki Yatsu, who turned pro with New Japan after the boycotted Olympics. Actually Yatsu's first pro match was in 1980 in Madison Square Garden. Yatsu, who still wrestles on any shows in Japan today, was Chashu and later Suritas, as a tag team called the Olympics holding the double tag team title five times, main tag team partner in both New Japan and later All Japan in the mid and late 80s. At one point Yatsu was one of the hottest stars in the business, and by 1986 was one of the top five workers. At the age of 31, he did an about face and went back to his childhood dream of winning an Olympic medal. He went back into amateur wrestling training and after a seven-year layoff, captured Japan's national title as a heavyweight in 1987. The International Olympic Committee then ruled because he was in pro wrestling, that made him a professional athlete and thus ineligible for the 1988 Games, that rule was amended in 1992. The heartbreak pretty much ended his enthusiasm and he gained a lot of weight, retired, talked about going for the 1992 Olympics but by then he was unable to get to that level, and then has come back but has never been the same. Frank Anderson of Sweden, who took the silver medal at 220 pounds in freestyle, did some wrestling including with WCW as recently as two years ago, but appeared to disappear shortly after a steroid conviction. The 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles wound up with two pro wrestlers. The biggest star was Hiroshi Hase, 
who placed 7th at 198 pounds in Greco-Roman wrestling. Hazi was working as a college professor after the Olympics when New Japan talked him into becoming a pro wrestler amidst much fanfare. He began his wrestling career in Puerto Rico, quickly went to Calgary where he debuted in 1986 as the Viet Cong Express, in a series of classic matches against another rookie, Owen Hart. He remained in Calgary for about a year and a half before he finally debuted for New Japan on December 27, 1987 beating Kunyaki Kobayashi to win the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title a historical first in that he was the first wrestler to win a major world title in Japan in his debut match in the country. Hazi gave up his position as the company's dominant junior heavyweight due to the emergence of Jushin Liger, who needed the position to get the gimmick over. As a booker Hazi was the most unselfish booker of his era, constantly putting over lesser talents and never focusing on himself, before suddenly retiring last year when he was recruited to run for political office, and is currently serving in the Japanese Senate. Tomo Honda All Japan represented Japan as a heavyweight in freestyle wrestling, placing fifth in Los Angeles. He returned to the Olympics in 1988 and 1992, losing to gold medalist Bruce Baumgartner the final time before debuting as a pro in October, 1993. Because Honda is 32 and hasn't taken to pro wrestling as quickly as the likes of a Hazi or an Akiyama, it doesn't appear he's going to ever be a top flight worker although he'll probably eventually be pushed into a solid high-level position. Dan Severn was an alternate at 220 pounds, losing a very controversial match in the finals of the trials to Lou Bannock, who went on to win the gold. Coming out of the 1988 Olympics were a few people who actually never made a strong mark in pro wrestling. In Greco-Roman, the Kozlowski twins from Minneapolis, who Vern Gagne had his eye on for years but by the time they were done with the amateurs, Gagne was done with promoting. Dennis, at 220, took a bronze, while Dwayne, at heavyweight, placed eighth. The two came back in 1992 with Dennis moving up to a silver and Dwayne placing seventh. Dwayne had one or two matches with the second incarnation of the UWF, including losing to Nobuiko Tuhata on a major show. Dennis went into UWFI in 1993-94 and showed a lot of star potential, but the two sides fell apart when the first contract ran out and he never returned. Gregory Verichev of the Soviet Union competed as a heavyweight in judo, and later worked for FMW as a rival and tag partner of Onita, but was a poor worker. Another Soviet, women's judoka Svetlana Gundarenko at 300 pounds, took a bronze, and came back in 1992 and, and didn't place. Gundarenko also worked one or two tours in 1992 for FMW, and came back in 1995 to win the first L1 Women's Ultimate Fight Tournament in Japan. David Gogjichvili, who was the heavyweight gold medalist in 1988, and came back in 1992 to win a bronze, did one pro wrestling match at the Tokyo Dome for pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi in 1992, putting over Minoru Suzuki. The only other participant in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics that went into pro wrestling was Manabu Nakanishi, a freestyler, who didn't place at 220 pounds. Nakanishi had won the national championship in freestyle in 1990, 1991 and 1992. He now works as Kurosawa in WCW, and was thought to be the next Sider Chashu Yatsu Hazi level New Japan superstar, but after nearly four years in pro wrestling, it's apparent that he isn't catching on. Ironically, the person he beat in the trials for the spot, Jun Akiyama of All Japan, caught on from the moment he took to pro wrestling like a duck to water, and is already a top 10 level worker. Current New Japan young wrestlers Yuji Nagata and Tokumitsu Ishizawa also lost in the Japanese Olympic trial finals for the 1992 team at 198 and 180 respectively. Chip Minton, who is currently working in the WCW training school and has done a few matches for both WCW and USWA, was the captain of the medal-winning U.S. bobsled racing team in the 1994 Olympics, the only Winter Olympian that we know of that has gone on to pro wrestling. World Championship Wrestling's Northeastern Invasion Tour was something of a mixed big. Considering the crowd's enthusiasm WCW has been drawing elsewhere of late, the crowds had to be a disappointment, in particular since they brought in two of the biggest area stars of the 70s, Bruno Sammartino and Pedro Morales, in an attempt to boost the gate. The shows in particular the matches in Philadelphia on June 29th got strong reports, one report said that the early matches were very good but the second half of the show was like a bad nitro. Hartford, with the giant no showing the main event due to transportation problems as he was shooting a movie on the West Coast, got more of a mixed reaction. We received plenty of reports from New York's Paramount show, with a generally positive reaction to the shows but some negative comments as well, with the biggest story being the profane outburst by Conan after his US title match with Kevin Sullivan, to fans that were chanting you still suck. ECW, and Sandman kicked your ass. 
Conant after swearing at the fans, which drew him a lot of heat among WCW officials, said that ECW was in a bingo hall and WCW was where the big boys played and they were drawing 5,000 people. Sullivan quickly got the mic away from him and basically did an apology saying that those weren't the opinions of WCW and that WCW wasn't feel that way and then said some politically very nice things about being a fan of ECW. Surprisingly, reports from Philadelphia is that there wasn't much in the way of a negative reaction from ECW fans, which surprised those at WCW who were expecting it in Philadelphia but not New York, to the point where even Jim Duggan got a big reaction. The only concession to location was in the Nasty Boys public enemy street fight, the Nasty Boys played heel and Public Enemy got the win. However, in New York, the crowd was vocal and negative and some wrestlers, in particular Conan and Eddie Guerrero, who the crowd booed probably more because his opponent, Chris Benoit, received such a thunderous babyface reaction, were noticeably affected in the ring. Most reports were that Flair received by far the best babyface reactions in Philadelphia and New York, although in Hartford it was more sting. It's really become strange trying to figure out some fans, because ECW was in Deer Park and drew maybe 400 people, so there were people chanting ECW at the WCW show instead of actually attending the ECW show in the same city going on at the same time, and perhaps even more people chanting ECW than attending ECW. It's as if some fans would rather chant ECW to get noticed at a so-called major event than actually attend ECW shows when they come to their city. In Hartford on June 28, WCW drew 5,707 fans, 3,931 paying $61,141. In Philadelphia on June 29, they drew 5,606 fans, 3,271 paying $50,667. And New York drew about 4,500 fans, 3,700 paying $90,000. New York was 200 to 300 short of capacity so from a dollar standpoint, WCW made about as much as they could have expected, but it has to be a disappointment to be unable, even though almost full, to sell out a small building in New York City with basically all the big names in the promotion except Hulk Hogan, and with San Martino and Morales added for nostalgia draws, after being out of the market for so many years. The general reaction we received is that nobody thought San Martino or Morales actually sold any tickets to the show, although there were fans at all three shows who were happy to see them. With the shows being well publicized in all three cities and it being WCW's first show in a long time in these markets, these figures can't be considered successful. In Hartford, there were signs outside the Civic Center saying that the giant wouldn't be appearing, although there was no announcement inside the building as to refunds being offered. Sting, who was scheduled to headline against Giant, they did DQ finishes when Luger interfered in the other cities, wound up teaming with Luger beating Arnold Anderson and Benoit, who worked twice. We received conflicting stories as to the reaction of Samartino and Morales. Samartino received what was termed a lukewarm reaction in Hartford to referee the Ric Flair vs. Randy Savage main event. The finish they did was that Flair got the pin using brass knucks, which he hit under his arm, and when his arm was raised, they fell, Samartino saw them and DQ'd Flair. They did two spot where Samartino shoved Flair down and another after the match where Samartino wanted to get it on with Flair, who left. Samartino, now 60, had problems during the match and there were comments that he did a Bronco Lubick style count not slapping the mat hard, which is understandable, but not what fans are used to. Apparently he received more than the $2,000 per show reported here as that figure was the first offer to him, which he turned down and was later upped although we don't know what it was up to. They changed the finish in New York and Philadelphia to a pinfall after a restart when Samartino saw the object, which seemed to get over better. In New York, we received reports that Samartino was very well received with chance of Bruno and other reports that it was actually Morales who was better received. In all three cities, Morales got involved in the finish of the Conan vs. Kevin Sullivan matches. Morales, now 53, decked Jimmy Hart at the finish and when Sullivan turned around, Conan schoolboyed him for the wins in matches where they brawled all over the building all three nights. Nostalgia was also the theme of the biggest show of the weekend, on June 30th where a sellout 16,000 fans attended the Rikitos and Memorial event at the Yokohama Arena. Rikitos and, who was murdered gangland style in 1963, was the first and to this day still the biggest superstar and national hero in the history of Japanese wrestling. This show was put together by Junzo Hasegawa, who was the president of the Japan Pro Wrestling promotion after Rikidos and passed away, who was better known as Yoshino Sato, along with other former wrestlers such as Michiaki Yoshimura, who was the Shawn Michaels of Japan in his day, Shinya Kojika, current president of Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Kantaro Hoshino, Kotetsu Yamamoto, 
a former wrestler now color commentator for several offices and New Japan Pro Wrestling. It was a multi-promotional show with 16 different offices represented, including both All Japan, which only sent a prelim match involving Rikido's and Son, Mitsuo Momota, and New Japan on the same card. However, unlike the Tokyo Dome show in 1995, this wasn't a situation where all the groups were competing by putting their best foot forward. The reaction was that the show was too heavy on the garbage promotions, and in fact, when the matches started, it appeared there was going to be a poor house as the majority of fans didn't even arrive until 30 minutes after the show was set to begin so as to avoid the underneath indie matches. Unlike at the Dome show, the contrast in working ability was far too noticeable and the show was poor underneath. Part of the problem was that Yamamoto, who ran the show from a booker standpoint, wouldn't allow chair or foreign object usage, juice, or brawling outside the ring or into the crowd. Having to keep the match in the ring without gimmicks showed up the poor promotions whose wrestlers didn't have the skill, and couldn't rely on the shortcuts to camouflage lack of working ability. Ironically, the highlight of the show turned out to be nostalgia from yet another generation. Satoru Sayama, the original Tiger Mask, 38, who retired in 1985 and has had a few comeback matches since then, donned the hood once again for a match against his protege, the current Tiger Mask, don't know his real name, that works for Michinoku Pro Wrestling. Sayama, who is largely responsible for the spotlight on and success of junior heavyweight wrestling in Japan to this day by putting the high-flying fast-paced style on the map from 1981 to 1983 with New Japan, now owns a martial arts gym and is a pioneer of sorts in a 180-degree different world as the promoter of both his own Japanese pro shooting, a sport he invented, and the Valley Tudo shoot promotion in Japan. The new Tiger Mask, who has been wrestling for less than one year, is actually so similar to a young Sayama that it's scary to watch when it comes to physique, moves and style, and is on the verge of being a great pro wrestler. The two had what was reported as the best match on the show, with Sayama doing all his Tiger Mask style moves, going to a 30-minute draw and going a 3-minute overtime period as well without a fall taken. Sayama, who was said to have been in the best shape he's been in for at least a decade, did a great job and when the time limit expired, the arena erupted in chance of more, more. The new Tiger Mask asked for an overtime, and Sayama agreed to go 3 more minutes, but by this point he was all blown up and the overtime saw him mainly use submissions on the mat. Complete results saw. 1. In a match from the Samurai Project promotion, Ryuma Go and Takeshi Miyamoto beat Samurai Max and Fumio Akiyama in 1435 when Go pinned Max in a poor opener. Because it went so long, fans were chanting for them to go to the finish. 2. In a match from the IWA Kakata Shijuku promotion, Goro Tsurumi pinned the Mummy in 709 after Mummy missed a headbutt off the top rope in another poor match. Mummy suffered a legit broken rib as he did a clumsy attempt at a diving headbutt off the top rope. Fans heavily booed the finish. 3. In an FMW match, the Gladiator, the only foreigner wrestler on the show, and Hisakatsu Oya beat Koji Nakagawa and Masato Tanaka when Gladiator pinned Nakagawa with a splash off the top rope in 12-13. Because they had to stay in the ring and not use gimmicks, this was another poor match. 4. In the IWA Japan match, Tarzan Goto pinned Takashi Okano in 16-11, with a power bomb. This was said to have gone too long and was boring, although with the crowd dead, Goto violated the rule and used a chair to the head to set up the winning move. 5. In the Big Japan match, Seiji Yamakawa and Kendo Nagasaki beat Yuichi Tanaguchi and Shoji Nakamaki in 12-58 when Yamakawa pinned Tanaguchi with a German suplex. For the same reason as FMW and IWA, this was a poor match. 6. In the LLPW match, Shinobu Kondori and Michiko Omukai beat Michiko Nagashima and Eagle Sawai in 1246 when Kondori pinned Nagashima. The crowd, which was largely people who attend one show a year, didn't know any of these women except Kondori, and were surprised at seeing the size of Sawai. Omukai's flying got the first good reaction of the show and the fans were into Kondori's submissions as well. A very good match. 7. In a combined GIA and JWP6 women's match, Shikusa Nagio of GIA teamed with Hiromi Yagi and Hikari Fukuoka of JWP to beat Dynamite Kansai of JWP teaming with GIA's bomber Hikari and Toshie Uematsu when Nagio pinned Uematsu after Fukuoka gave her a moonsault in 1323. This was said to have been a great match, with Kansai kicking the hell out of her foes, Fukuoka getting a good reaction to her wrestling and flying moves and Nagio and Kansai against each other drawing good heat. 8. In the All Japan match, Mitsuo Momoto pinned Masao Inoue in 8.35 in a fair match. There was much criticism of All Japan for sending two prelim wrestlers rather than top names to this show, 
but they had a show of their own going on at the same time at Karakuen Hall which is about a 40-minute drive from this arena, 9. In an interpromotional match, Jado and Hiramichi Fuyuki over war beat Kiao's dojo's duo of Koji Kiao and Masaki Mochizuki when Fuyuki pinned Mochizuki in 12:26 after a running clothesline. Not good at all. Fuyuki did a lot of comedy which somewhat saved it since Kiao is such a poor worker, 10. In an interpromotional match with Japan Pro Shooting vs. Michinoku Pro Wrestling, Satoru Sayama as Tiger Mask went to a draw with the current Tiger Mask after 33 minutes. It's interesting that Japan Pro Shooting bills itself as the only 100% shoot fighting organization in the world, yet its owner and promoter participated in a total high flying pro wrestling match. 11. In another interpromotional match, pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi's Yoshiaki Fujiwara went to a double count out with UWFI's Yoji Anjo when both were on the floor trying for ankle locks on each other as the ref counted them both out. The crowd reaction to the finish must have been awful, since Japanese fans hate non clean finishes to begin with. To have two guys from so-called shoot groups which always have clean finishes, do an interpromotional match, and not have a finish has to be considered a slap in the face of the fans. After the match, Fujiwara grabbed the house mic and quelled the crowd saying he was going to go backstage and bring in Akira Maeda to wrestle Anjo. Anjo sat down in the ring and Fujiwara didn't come back for a long time and finally said that it was a joke. 12. In a pure New Japan match, said to have been a very good match, Keiji Muto and Kensuke Sasaki beat Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata in 1451 when Muto pinned Hirata after a moonsault, 13. In the main event, a mixed promotions match, Genichiro Tenryu of War and Tatsumi Fujinami of New Japan beat Koki Kitahara of War and Riki Chashu of New Japan in 1351 when Tenryu pinned Kitahara with a powerbomb. Kitahara suffered a bloody nose and mainly sold for the two veterans with Chashu getting a hot tag. Overall a good main event. In what is a landmark story when it comes to wrestling journalism, but Tarzan Yamamoto, the editor of Weekly Pro Wrestling since its debut in 1984, resigned this past week. Yamamoto had been embroiled in a feud with New Japan Pro Wrestling, the country's largest office, which, along with UWFI and War, had banned the magazine from covering its events for the past few months. With magazine sales declining 8% in the past month alone, while rival Weekly Gong has seen a 16% increase and was selling its copies of the newsstands at a record rate, according to most reports. Some reports are that Gong was selling 95% of its newsstand mags, which is a figure totally unheard of in the magazine publishing business where 30-40% to is considered successful, since it was the only full-color weekly to cover those three offices, Yamamoto resigned. It is believed, although not official at press time, that New Japan will now allow Weekly Pro, a subsidiary of baseball magazine Shaw, to begin coverage of its events starting with the G1 Climax in August. With so many major New Japan, UWFI and war events in the summer and fall, the pressure on Weekly Pro to end this war amidst declining sales and is important, the fact its main competitor has become so hot, has been enormous of late. Weekly Pro has gone to heavy coverage of all Japan, Michinoku, Rings, Pancrase, the Japanese garbage groups, women and American wrestling, and in particular has pushed ECW to the moon, to pick up the slack. Yamamoto who is credited with bringing mainstream coverage of pro wrestling in Japan from the after mag level almost to observer level, except that his magazine had a circulation of 300,000 per week making it far more influential. By all accounts Yamamoto was one of the most powerful and influential people in wrestling in Japan. According to one book on pro wrestling written in Japan, Yamamoto was called the most influential person in the entire pro wrestling world. Because of basically inventing, at least in Japan, a critical approach to covering wrestling matches and angles and behind-the-scenes news, Yamamoto was often criticized for revealing too much in his magazines. Traditionalists felt they hurt the business, despite the fact the Japanese business went through a major upswing during most of that period. His strong coverage of shooting style groups and shoot sports, and pointing out they were shoot groups, not saying the others weren't but the illusion was there, along with being critical of groups with the attitude of if you don't like us, don't come made him numerous enemies throughout the years, both from rival magazines and from several different offices. In particular after successfully promoting a show in April of 1995 which sold out the Tokyo Dome and had main event caliber matches from 13 different offices, the other publications and others in the business got even hotter at the power he was able to wield and the groups were supposedly afraid that if they didn't cooperate with his show, it would mean diminished coverage in the most important magazine. Rival publications were so bitter at the power wielded that for the most part they boycotted coverage of in some ways the biggest pro wrestling event ever in the country. There were fears and rumors started throughout Japan, which turned out to be unfounded, that Yamamoto, 
50 who also hosted his own late-night weekly pro wrestling talk show for most of last year, was going to use the Dome Show, which drew something like $5.5 million, as a springboard to start his own promotion. Others had criticized him of late for favoring promotions that he had business dealings with, with Weekly Pro being heavily criticized by outsiders for its deal where it markets ECW tapes in Japan and in exchange has given ECW tons of coverage in its magazine. Yamamoto had bragged at WrestleMania in regard to the new Japan ban that he had never lost a war yet. He had previous conflicts with All Japan, War, SWS, etc. all of which resulted in the promotions making amends with him because of the power his magazine yielded. With New Japan so hot, and Weekly Pro banned from coverage, he was in a war that this time, he didn't win. However, those close to him say that this resignation in many ways is more than it seems a calculated wrestling angle and that he's going to leave, write a few books on pro wrestling, and return in another venue as powerful as ever. Results June 20, Jalapa, AAA, 5,500 sellout, Aladini is del Espacio and Caballero Ninja B. Panner and Caballero Negro and Zulima and La Sirenita and Jalisa B. Fujitiba and Practicandi and Martha Villalobos, Frisbee and Luxor and Boomerang and Gio and Neo B. Mr. Condor and Marabunta and Angel Mortal and Hollywood and Yeti, Super Mineco and Oro Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. and Alcone Dorado Jr. B. Los Villanos and Cars La Momia DQ, Lumberjack Strap Match, Mascara Sagrada, New, and Octagon and Demon Jr. B. Jerry Estrada and Killer and Psicosis. June 21st Mexico City Arena Mexico, EMLL, La Diabolica and La Infernal B. Jocelyn and Lady Apache, Olimpico and Olympus and Ultimatum B. Yone Jinjin and Espectro Jr., and Cadaver de Ultra Tumba, Black Warrior and Scorpio Jr. and Guerrero de la Muerte B. Bronco and Super Astro and Mr. Niebla, Dandy and Silver King and Hector Garza B. El Satanico and Felino and El Eo del Gladiador, Atlantis and Mascara Sagrada Original and Rio de Jalisco Jr. B. Kinec and Dr. Wagner Jr. and Negro Casas. June 21st Netzawal Coyote, AAA, Flama Rojo B. Gran Petronio, Pero Silva and Espectro and El Mosco B. Torero and Salsero and El Mexicano, Mexican National Women's Title, Martha Villalobos B. Jalissa, Los Villanos B. El Cone Dorado Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. and Super Manieco, Octagon and Pantera and Mascara Sagrada Nu, B. Jerry Estrada and Fishman and Kraken. June 22nd Winnipeg, MB, WWF, 5,500 Fairground Show, Savio Vega B. Steve Austin, WWF Tag Titles, Godwins B. Smoking Guns DQ, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Mankind B. Jake Roberts, Ahmed Johnson B. Owen Hart, Yokozuna B. Vader. June 23rd Morelia, Mishokan, AAA, Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Mini Frisbee B. Espectritos 1 and 2 Elimination Match, Luxor and Discovery and Boomerang and Neo and Geo B. Angel Mortal and Mr. Condor and Marabunta and Paro Silva and El Mosco, Rey Mysterio Jr. and Teen Yeblis Jr. and Alcone Dorado Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. B. Super Crazy and Picudo, and Heavy Metal and Jerry Estrada DQ, Killer and CN Cars B. Pieroth Jr. B. Octagon and La Parca and Mascara Sagrada DQ. June 24th Saratopia Toki, New Japan, 2250 Sellout, Katsuhiro Takaiwa B. Yutaka Yoshi, Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Yuji Nagata, Brad Armstrong B. Black Cat, El Samurai and Norio Onaga B. Tokumitsu Ishizawa and Shinjiro Otani, Kengo Kimura and Tatsutoshi Goto B. Tadao, Yasuda and Osamu Kido, Osamu Nishimura and Takashi Izuka B. Akitoshi Saito and Akira Nagami, Hawkam Animal and Power Warrior B. Keiji Muto and Riki Chashu and Satoshi Kojima, Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata and Jushin Liger B. Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito, June 24th Miyagi, FNW, Shoichi Funaki B. Toru, Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Gasaku Goshigawara B. Okamoto and Akira Nagami, Shark Tsuchiya and Crusher Maidamari and Bad Nurse Nakamura B. Aki Kambayashi and Kaori Nakayama and Megumi Kudo, Independent Junior Title, Takamichi no Kubi Nanjo Hayato Elimination Match, Super Leather and Head Hunters and Freddy Krueger B. The Gladiator and Hisakatsu Oya and Horace Boulder and Riki Fuji, no Rope Barbed Wire Street Fight Tornado Double Hell Spider Net Broken Glass Death Match, Wing Kanemura and Haido and Hideki Hasaka B. Masato Tanaka and Koji Nakagawa and Mr. Pogo. June 25th Lacrosse, Y, WWF Superstars Tapings, 3,523, Non-Squash Results, Aldo Montoya B. Don Callis, Davey Boy Smith B. Buck Zumhof, Mark Marrow B. Callis, Freddie Joe Floyd, Tracy Smothers, B. Justin Bradshaw, T.L. Hopper, Tony Anthony. B. Duke Drossi, Alex Porto B. Barry Horowitz, Bradshaw B. Floyd, Mero B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Sabio Vega B. Who, Jim Neidhart, 
Jake Roberts B. Mankind DQ Ultimate Warrior B. Vader Core WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Goldust. June 25th, Fukuoka, Pancrase 7500 Sellout Q Makunyo Ku B. Takafumi Ito, Guy Mr. D. Asami Shibuya, Manabu Yamada D. Ishiki Takahashi, Yuki Kondo B. Minoru Suzuki, Rishi Yanagisawa B. Takaku Fuk, Boss Rutan B. Jason Delusha, Masakatsu Funaki B. Vernon White. June 25th, Keisumageora, New Japan, 2200 Tokamitsu Ishizawa B. Akitoshi Saito, Yuji Nagata B. Brad Armstrong, Akira Nagami and Kunyaki Kobayashi B. Shinjiro Otani and Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Black Cat and Norio Onaga B. El Samurai and Jushin Liger, Tatsutoshi Goto B. Osamu Nishimura, Tadao Yasuda and Satoshi Kojima B. Mishioshi Ohara and Kengo Kimura, Hawken Animal and Power Warrior B. Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata and Osamu Kido, Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito B. Keiji Muto and Riki Chashu and Takashi Izuka. June 25th, Takasu FMW Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Koji Nakagawa B. Okamoto and Shoichi Funaki, Takamichi no Kubi Toryu, Shark Tsuchiya and Crusher Maidamari and Miwa Sato B. Aki Kanbayashi and Kaori Nakayama and Megumi Kudo, Super Leather B. Gasaku Goshigawa, Mr. Pogo B. Riki Fuji, Horace Boulder and Hisakatsu Oya and the Gladiator B. Nanjo Hayato and Katsutoshi Niyama and Masato Tanaka Street Fight, Hideki Hasaka and Haido and Wing Kanimura B. Freddy Krueger and Head Hunters. June 25th, Miyagi, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Filanito B. Orito, Masanobu Kurisu B. Cage Boshi, Gekko and Kishin Kawabata B. Astro Jr. and Shocker, Baizama B. Shigeo Okamura, Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasuke B. Great Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benkei, Sabu and Takashi Ishikawa B. Abdullah the Butcher and Billy Black. June 26th, Nagoya Rainbow Hall, UWFI 8000, Koki Kitahara B. 150% Machine, Kazushi Sakuraba B. Rene Rosa, Hiromitsu Kaneyara B. Billy Scott, Yoji Anjo B. Yuhi Sano, Genichiro Tenryu and Arashi B. Yoshihiro Takayama and 200% Machine, Tatsumi Fujinami and Yoshiaki Fujiwara B. Masahito Kakihara and Nobuiko Takada. June 26, Iratsuka, New Japan, 3000, Black Cat B. Yutaka Yoshi, Tadao Yasuda B. Yuji Nagata, Osamu Kido B. Akitoshi Saito, Shinjiro Otani and Norio Onaga B. Jushin Liger and Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Junji Hirata and Riki Chashu B. Akira Nagami and Kunyaki Kobayashi, Keiji Muto and Takashi Izuka B. Brad Armstrong and El Samurai, Hawken Animal and Power Warrior B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masachono DQ Osamu Nishimura and Satoshi Kojima and Shinya Hashimoto B. Rusher Kimura and Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara. June 27, Louisville, Kentucky, WWF, 3256, Duke Drossi B. Eldo Montoya, Montoya B. Drossi, Bushwhackers B. New Rockers, Savio Vega B. Justin Bradshaw, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Phineas Godwin B. Billy Gunn, Undertaker B. Mankind, Davy Boy Smith B. Yokozuna, IC Title, Ahmed Johnson B. Gold Dust Corps, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader DQ. June 28, Indianapolis, WWF, 5501 Bushwhackers B. New Rockers 1 and 1 half star, Savio Vega B. Justin Bradshaw, Phineas Godwin B. Billy Gunn 2 stars, I see title, Ahmed Johnson B. Goldust Core 2 and a half stars, Undertaker B. Mankind 3 stars, Davy Boy Smith B. Yokozuna 1 star, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley 3 and 3 quarter stars, Johnson B. Owen Hart Dud, WWF title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader 2 and a half stars. June 28, Hartford, Connecticut, WCW, 5,70 July 3,931 paid, Chris Benoit B. Eddie Guerrero 2 and 1 quarter stars, Dean Malenko B. Steve Regal 2 and 1 quarter stars, Jim Duggan B. VK Wall Street 1 and 1 half star, U.S. title, Conan B. Kevin Sullivan 1 and 1 quarter stars, WCW tag titles, Harlem Heat Kerr Rick and Scott Steiner 2 and a half stars, Street Fight Nasty Boys B. Public Enemy 2 and a half stars, Sting and Lex Luger B. Benoit and Arnold Anderson 2 and 1 quarter stars, Bruno Sammartino Ref, Randy Savage B. Rick Flair DQ 2 stars, June 28, Takamichi, New Japan, 2200 sellout, Tokamitsu Ishizawa B. Utaka Yoshi, El Samurai B. Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Yuji Nagata B. Kunyaki Kobayashi, Osamu Nishimura B. Brad Armstrong, Shinjiro Otani and Satoshi Kojima B. Akitoshi Saito and Tatsutoshi Goto, Hawken Animal and Power Warrior B. Tadao Yasuda and Junji Hirata and Riki Chashu, Mishiyoshi Ohara and Akira Nagami B. Jushin Liger and Keiji Muto, Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito B. Shinya Hashimoto and Takashi Izuka and Osamu Kido. 
June 28, Tokyo Karakuen Hall FMW, 2150 Sellout, Katsutoshi Niyamabi Okamoto, Shuichi Fanaki and Takamichi no Kubi Nanjo Hayato and Toryu, Hideki Hasakabi Freddy Krueger, Crusher Matamari and Shark Tsuchiya and Miwa Satobi Megumi Kudo and Aki Kanbayashi and Kaori Nakayama, The Gladiator and Horace Boulder be Riki Fuji and Hisakatsu Oya, Haido and Wing Kanemura, Bigasaku Goshigawara and Mr. Pogo, World Street Fight Six Man Championship, Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Koji Nakagawa and Masato Tanaka be Super Leather and Head Hunters to win titles. June 29th Detroit Joe Louis Arena, WWF 5930, Bushwhackers be New Rockers, Savio Vega be Justin Bradshaw, Mark Merrow be Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Davey Boy Smith be Yokozuna, IC title, Ahmed Johnson be Goldust Core, WWF title, Shawn Michaels be Vader DQ, WWF tag titles, Godwins be Smoking Guns DQ, Sid be Owen Hart, Undertaker be Mankind. June 29, Philadelphia Civic Center, WCW, 5,606 with 3,271 paid, Chris Benoit be Eddie Guerrero 3 and 3 quarter stars, Dean Malenko be Steve Regal 3 stars, Jim Duggan be VK Wall Street 3 quarters of a star, US title, Conan be Kevin Sullivan 2 and a half stars, WWF tag titles, Rick and Scott Steiner be Harlem Heat DQ 2 and 3 quarter stars, WCW TV title, Lex Luger be Arnold Anderson 3 quarters of a star, Street Fight, Public Enemy be Nasty Boys 2 and 3 quarter stars, Bruno Sammartino ref, Randy Savage be Ric Flair 2 and 1 quarter stars, WCW title, The Giant be Sting DQ 1 and 3 quarter stars. June 29th Tokyo Bay NK Hall, Rings, 6700 sellout, Willie Peters be Wataru Sakata, Masayoshi Naruse be Todor Todorov, Bitsay to Milan B. Lufkin, Kiyoshi Tamura B. Dick Frey, Suyashi Kosaka B. Jacob Hamilton, Folk Han B. Mitsuya Nagai, Yoshihise Yamamoto B. Maurice Smith, 30 minutes. June 29th, Niigata, New Japan, 3,800 sellout, Akitoshi Saito B. Yutaka Yoshi, Tatsuhito Takaiwa B. Tokumitsu Ishizawa Osamu Nishimura and Takashi Izuka B. Tadao Yasuda and Satoshi Kojima, Jushin Liger and El Samurai B. Norio Onaga and Shinjiro Otani, Keiji Muto B. Brad Armstrong. Riki Chashu and Yuji Nagata be Mishiyoshi Ohara and Kunyaki Kobayashi, Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata be Akira Nagami and Tatsutoshi Goto, Hawk and Animal and Power Warrior be Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito. June 29th Tokyo Karakuen Hall, All Japan, 2100 Sellout, Satoru Asako be Kentaro Shiga, Ryukaku Izamida and Giant Kimala 2 be Mark and Chris Youngblood, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto be Haruka Aigen and Masafuchi and Mighty Inoue, Johnny Smith and the Patriot and Johnny Ace be Masao Inoue and Yoshinari Ogawa and Tamon Honda, Steve Williams be Manukiya Mossman, Toshiaki Kaoda and Tsuyashi Kikuchi be Rob Van Dam and Gary Albright, Stan Hansen and Bobby Duncombe Jr. be Akira Tao and Takao Mori, Mitsuharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama be Kenna Kobashi and Brian Diet. June 29th Middletown, New York, ECW, 700 Devin Storm B. L. Puerto Ricano, J.T. Smith and Little Guido B. Bubba Ray Dudley and Big Dick Dudley DQ, Shane Douglas B. Mikey Whipwreck, Taz B. Hack Myers, ECW TV title, Chris Jericho B. Pit Bull No. 2, ECW Tag Titles, Eliminators B. Gangsters, Weapons Match, Tommy Dreamer B. Brian Lee, ECW title, Raven B. Sandman. June 29th, Honolulu, Hawaii, Future Fights, 3,500 Middleweight Tournament, J. Palmer B. Andre Sarka, Higart Chin B. Hiroki Notsugi, Palmer B. Chin to win Tourney, Light Heavyweight Tournament, Jerry Bullender B. Alan Shibble, Chris Charnos B. Jesse Matilla, Bullender B. Charnos to win Tourney, Heavyweight Tournament, Tri Teligman B. Brian Matapua, Teligman B. Walt Darby to win Tournament. June 29th, Sapporo, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Morito B. Filainito Astro Jr. and Shocker B. Cage Boshi and Gekko, Kishin Kawabata D. Shigeo Okamura, Yoshihiro Takayama and Billy Black B. Masanobu Kurisu and Masashi Aoyagi, Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasu B. Great Kabuki and Akihiko Masuda, Sabu B. Weizama Core, TWA Tag Titles 2 out of 3 Falls, Abdullah the Butcher and Daiko Kubo Benke B. Takashi Ishikawa and Yoji Anjo to win titles. June 30th, Pittsburgh Civic Arena, WWF, 6264, Bushwhackers be New Rockers 1 star, Sabio Vega be Justin Bradshaw 1 star, Sid be Owen Hart 1 star, IC title, Ahmed Johnson be Goldust Core 2 stars, WWF title, Shawn Michaels be Vader DQ 3 stars, 
WWF Tag Titles, Smoking Guns B. Godwins 2 Stars, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley 2 Stars, Davey Boy Smith B. Yokozuna 1 Star, Undertaker B. Mankind 1 Star. June 30, New York Paramount, WCW 4, 500 thirds, 700 paid, Chris Benoit B. Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko B. Steve Regal, Jim Duggan B. VK Wall Street, U.S. title, Conan B. Kevin Sullivan, WCW Tag Titles, Rick and Scott Steiner B. Harlem Heat DQ, WCW TV title, Lex Luger B. Arnold Anderson, Street Fight, Nasty Boys B. Public Enemy, Bruno Sammartino Ref, Randy Savage B. Ric Flair, WCW title, The Giant B. Sting DQ. June 30, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, All Japan, 2100 Sellout, Tsuyashi Kikuchi B. Kentaro Shiga, Manukia Mossman and Rob Van Dam B. Giant Kimala 2 and Ryukaku Izumida, Haruka Aigen and Tamon Honda and Takao Mori B. Satoru Asako and Rusher Kimura and Jumbo Tsurida, The Patriot and Johnny Ace and Bobby Duncombe Jr. B. Mark and Chris Youngblood and Johnny Smith, PWF Junior Title, Masafuchi B. Yoshinari Ogawa to win Title 2131, Akira Town and Toshiaki Kaona be Steve Williams and Brian Diet. Stan Hansen be Jun Akiyama. Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenna Kobashi be Gary Albright and Giant Baba 2712. June 30, Deer Park, New York. ECW 400 sellout. Taz be Pablo Marquez three quarters of a star. Mikey Whipwreck be Stevie Richards two and one quarter stars. JT Smith and Little Guido be Big Dick Dudley and Bubba Ray Dudley DQ two stars. Sandman B. Blue Dust Dud, Pitbull No. 2 B. Shane Douglas 1 Star, Brian Levy Dances with Dudley 1 Half of 1 Star, ECW Tag Titles, Eliminators B. Chris Jericho and Whipwreck 3 and 3 Quarter Stars, ECW Title, Raven B. Tommy Dreamer 3 Stars. July 1st Landover, MDUS Air Arena, WCW Monday Nitro Tapings, 7,000 4,000 Paid, WCW Tag Titles, Arlem Heat B. Rick and Scott Steiner 2 and a half stars. Disco Inferno B. Kurosawa Dud. Diamond Dallas Page B. Scotty Riggs 1 star. Randy Savage B. Greg Valentine 1 star. WCW title. The Giant B. John Tenna 1 and 1 half star. Rick Flair and Arnold Anderson and Chris Benoit and Steve McMichael B. Renegade and Joe Gomez and Rock and Roll Express 3 stars. Bruno Sammartino Ref. Savage B. Flair. Special thanks to Neziba Mario. Ed Schrieber, Georgian Macropolis, Bruce Buchanan, Woody Clay, Greg John, Ron Lemieux, Dominic Valenti, G.W. Graham, Bernard Siegel, Dan Riley, Dan Paris, John Muse, Chris Savisa, Evan Schlesinger, David Milliken, Edie Bailey, Chuck Longerman, Tim Knoll, Matt Langley, Peggy Watkins, Michael Monsky, Daniel Bird, Dan Moreland, Jeff Osborne, Jesse Money, Roland Alexander, Steve Dr. Luke. All Japan. There is a story behind the scenes going on regarding Toshiaki Kawada but I'm not sure of all the details. Apparently he gave a magazine interview where he was critical of management's isolationist policy and suggesting something to the effect that they'd missed the boat when it came to the interpromotional matches that drew so much money in the last few years. The rumor had it that Kawada would be doing some jobs because of that. Whether that's related to this or not, they have done a deal where Kawada and Gary Albright, who were supposed to be pushed as a team on the tour that started June 29th, will no longer be teaming. The two were scheduled at the July 24th Budokan Hall show to face tag champs Mitsuharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama, but instead Kawada faces Albright in a singles match. Baba announced the card will feature four singles main event matches, but aside from the Kawada Albright and Akira Tao vs. Kenna Kobashi triple crown match, the other two haven't been announced although no doubt Misawa and Akiyama will be involved. Masafuchi captured the PWF Junior title for the fifth time beating Yoshinari Ogawa on June 30 at the Karakuen Hall. Rookie Brian Diet, who has been getting rave reviews, he has not appeared on television yet but reports we are told is that after basically one month in wrestling he already works like a five-year pro, got his first Karakuen Hall main event on June 29 teaming with Kenna Kobashi losing to Misawa and Akiyama. On June 30 also at Karakuen, Diet and his coach, Steve Williams, lost to Kawada and Tao on a card which also saw the junior title change. Stan Hansen pin Akiyama and Misawa and Kobashi over Giant Baba and Albright when Misawa pinned Albright in 27-12. Rob Van Dam and Manukia Mossman are expected to get a mid-level push as a tag team and will likely win the Asian tag titles over the next two weeks. June 23rd TV show did a whopping 4.4 rating. New Japan Several matches for the G1 Climax Tournament and the Junior Heavyweight Tournament which both take place August 2nd to August 6th at Sumo Hall were announced.
the G1 will be the round robin in two blocks with five wrestlers in each block, with the two high point getting meeting in a championship match. The Junior Tournament of Champions will be a single elimination. On August 2nd, in the juniors, Great Sasuke, IWGP Junior, faces Masayoshi Motegi, NWA Junior, and Jushin Liger, Great Britain Junior, faces Ultimo Dragon, International Junior, plus G1 matches with Riki Chashu vs. Shinya Hashimoto, Kensuke Sasaki vs. Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Keiji Muto vs. Kazuo Yamazaki and Masa Chono vs. Satoshi Kojima. On August 3rd, in the juniors, Gran Hamada, WWA Junior Light Heavyweight, faces El Samurai, WWF Light Heavyweight, and Shinjiro Otani, UWA Light Heavyweight, faces the final tournament participant to be announced. Originally it was going to be Super Delphin, but he dropped his claim to the CMLL welterweight title last week to Mascara Magica. My feeling is it'll be either Hayabusa or Dean Malenko. Since it's supposed to be the eight most important junior titles in the sport and leaving Malenko out makes WCW, a new Japan business partner, look bad. In G1 matches, Chashu vs. Tenzan, Sasaki vs. Junji Hirata, Muto vs. Kojima and Shiro Koshinaka vs. Yamazaki. August 4th will be the junior semifinals plus Chashu vs. Hirata, Hashimoto vs. Tenzan, Chono vs. Koshinaka and Kojima vs. Yamazaki. August 5th will be the junior finals plus Chashu vs. Sasaki, Hashimoto vs. Hirata, Muto vs. Koshinaka and Chono vs. Yamazaki. August 6th will be Hashimoto vs. Sasaki, Hirata vs. Tenzan, Muto vs. Chono and Koshinaka vs. Kojima, plus the two highest point-getters will come back in a championship match. Dan Severn will wrestle on August 5th and August 6th but they haven't announced who his opponents will be. The current tour, with the main drawing deal being Hawk and Power and Animal touring the country working six mans and basically winning every night, has been playing to sellouts most nights. June 22nd TV did a 2.2 rating. Other Japan Notes Besides the Rikidozen show, the biggest shows of the week were Pancrase on June 25th and Rings on June 29th. The Pancrase show drew a sellout 7,500 in Fukuoka, largely due to the Ken Shamrock vs. Masakatsu Fanaki announced main event. Shamrock blew out his left knee in training and underwent surgery on June 20, thus couldn't wrestle although he did go to Japan to attend the show. Fanaki beat Vernon White via submission in 234. The biggest shock was in an underneath match where Yuki Kondo, who debuted in January, won a split decision after going 15 minutes with Minoru Suzuki. In addition, 20-year-old Asami Shibuya, who had the great pay-per-view match against Jason Delucia, held Guy Mesger to a 10-minute draw with judges calling the match even. In the other top matches, Boss Rudin beat Delucia 8-48 when the referee stopped the match and Ryushi Yanagisawa beat Takaku Fug 2-0 on points after they went the 30-minute time limit. On a 7-match card, the first 5 matches all went the time limit. With things like that, Kondo beating Suzuki, and the fact that when you watch the tape, the holes just aren't there, I'm pretty well of the belief that Pancrase is legitimate sport. The next Pancrase shows are July 22nd and July 23rd, which I believe are at Karakuen Hall and will be the Neo Blood Tournament which is a tourney for the underneath wrestlers. The next major show isn't until September 7th which would be the next pay-per-view taping provided pay-per-view of Pancrase would still exist in the US by that point, with Rutan vs. Funaki for the King of Pancrase Championship and Ken Shamrock vs. Suzuki. There were lots of rumors swirling around this show that Ken Shamrock would be going to New Japan next year, after his Pancrase contract expires, and Funaki even addressed them publicly. I don't think there's anything to them, and the day it started simply because Oleg Taktorov is a friend of Shamrock's, and he worked the show in Los Angeles which even though it wasn't a New Japan show is basically considered as a New Japan show by a lot of people and it is known Inoki wants to create a shooter's promotion as part of New Japan. Rings had its hottest show in a long time drawing a sellout 6,700 to Tokyo Bay NK Hall, with a big crowd largely due to the debut of Kiyoshi Tamura. Tamura who appeared to have been trimmed down to 180 pounds and was ripped, beat Dick Frey in 341 with a choke sleeper. The minion event saw Yoshihisa Yamamoto and Maurice Smith go the 30-minute time limit with Yamamoto winning a judge's decision. The next show will be July 16th in Osaka Furitsu Gym with Yamamoto vs. Frey on top, plus Volkan vs. Hans Nyman, Bitsaid Teriel vs. Mitsuya Nagai and Tamura vs. Willie Peters. The sport of shootboxing has a show on July 14th at the Ariaki Coliseum in Tokyo which will have two UFC rules matches Kazushi Sakuraba at UWFI faces Kimo, which one would think promises to be a bad night for Sakuraba and Ilukine Mikhail of Russia, who won a Russian version of a UFC tournament last year, faces Meister Hulk of Brazil, who is the guy who destroyed Amuri Bitetti in the finals of this year's Brazilian Valley Tudo Championship.
UWFI drew and announced 8,000 at Nagoya Rainbow Hall for a main event where Tatsumi Fujinami and Yoshiaki Fujiwara beat Masahito Kakihara and Nobuiko Takata in 17:10 when Fujiwara made Kakihara submit to the Achilles tendon hold. Abdullah the Butcher and Daikokubo Benkei beat the TWA, for Tokyo Pro Wrestling, tag titles on June 29 in Sapporo beating Takashi Ishikawa and Yoji Anjo in a 2 out of 3 falls match. Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Koji Nakagawa and Masato Tanaka won FMW's World Street Fight six-man titles beating the first champs, Head Hunters and Super Leather on June 28 at Kurakuen Hall. Hayabusa was at the show which says that the angle where he was fired was an angle. He was even attacked at the show by Nakagawa. ECW Pete Sinurka, Taz, was upset with comments made by Paul Varlins both here and elsewhere. He said that from the start, Paul Heyman had told him Varlins had agreed to do the job while Varlins appeared apprehensive about doing it acting like he didn't know what the plans were for him. He said Varlins had told him he thought it would be a slow build-up rather than doing the match three weeks after the angle. He said in the one workout session that had at the ECW school, that Varlins had to be taught how to properly apply a front headlock and Perry Satullo Saturn, the other coach at the school said that trap fighting, which Varlins is a black belt in, must mean that if you get in a fight, you're trapped. He doesn't know how to do anything. He's clumsy. Taz could have eaten him up, Sinurka said in their match that Varlins left him several openings to tear him up. In a straight shoot, he was wide open at all times, Sinurka said the fact there were several heels around the ring during the match was because it was ECW versus UFC and they wanted to show ECW heels as being unified behind him. I don't need anyone to defend me. I've lost fights before, but that kid can't beat me. Both Sinurka, who wrestled for two years at the University of Massachusetts and one year at CW Post, and Heyman said that Varlins was offered the opportunity to do a shoot but turned it down. Sinurka said it was in a conversation between the two when Varlins was unhappy about doing the job, and he said he'd go to Paul and see if they could both get more money because what they were going to make wasn't enough to do a shoot. He said Varlins said that it was okay. Heyman said it was in a phone conversation that all three were on. Sinurka said he can see why the UFC people like Varlins, because he's a big guy with a good look. He's a wild puncher and can take a good punch, and said that he doesn't want to say that Varlins was afraid of him, only that Varlins said he wasn't here to do a shoot. I've seen him and he definitely doesn't have a glass jaw. I wouldn't be this hot if he didn't make the silly comments about me being up to his waist. My size has nothing to do with it. His size is irrelevant. We're all the same size on the mat. He was wide open so many times in the match. The only reason I'm bitter is because he's crying the blues. My own feeling is that since this is pro wrestling we're talking about, as written last week, who would win in a real shoot has nothing at all to do with it. Pro wrestling is about manipulation not reality and the idea for Taz to fight a shooter and get a work submission win was about manipulation, no different than what worked for Antonio Inoki for all those years. It ended up being a bad match and everyone involved seems to be unhappy in hindsight because things didn't go down as they had all hoped for whatever reason. Sandman's nine-year-old son, Tyler Fullington, was the star of the weekend with house shows on June 29 in Middletown, New York and June 30 in Deer Park, New York before an estimated 700 and 400 fans. The first night, Raven defended the title against Sandman. Sandman's knee is still bad and he really can't work so they did the camouflage bit which Raven is really great at. Sandman was caning everyone when Raven pulled Tyler in front of him. Sandman stopped. Later in the match, as Sandman was about to win the title, Tyler caned his father and Raven pinned him. The Middletown show was mainly brawling all over the building and people called here saying it was dangerous to be a fan because the wrestlers were running through them and fans were getting minor injuries because they couldn't get out of the way. Tommy Dreamer and Brian Lee did a spoof on the Sullivan Benoit deal, except they went into the women's bathroom and there was a woman in there and did more damage to the bathroom. We still haven't had anyone flush anyone's head in the toilet yet, but I'm sure it's coming. In Deer Park, Raven wrestled Dreamer and they did a spoof on the Michael Smith double pin finish. When each ref raised a hand, both wrestlers simultaneously DDT'd the other ref. Bubba Ray Dudley came into ref, but Devon Dudley hit Bubba and Dreamer with a chair and one of the refs recovered and counted the pin. After the match, Sandman ran in, but he wound up being caned by his son again. Sandman's wife, who used to be called Peaches, is now being called by her real name of Lori Fullington. In Deer Park, Eliminators had a Japanese-style hot match with Chris Jericho and Mikey Whipwreck. Told the crowds both nights were really bloodthirsty, even by ECW standards, so even though there wasn't anything that would be called good wrestling except maybe the Eliminators match with Jericho and Whipwreck, the fans came to see the brawling and the blood, both of which were provided. On this past week's TV, 
they aired Stevie Richards doing the Baron Von Stevie deal doing a poor goose step and claw. It was so bad it was good. They also aired Raven vs. Terry Gordy. Gordy is nowhere close to what he once was, but they did an excellent job of hiding it, mainly by keeping the match outside the ring and just having Gordy destroy Raven with chair shots. They are trying to do the Jake Roberts comeback deal with Gordy. Actually because Raven did such a great job of camouflaging what Gordy isn't, the fans thought Gordy was the old Gordy and went really nuts for him during the match. Louis Spicoli debuts on July 12th in Allentown and will wrestle Sabu at the arena on July 13th. Of the Samoan is expected to manage the Samoan gangsta party at least in his hometown of Allentown. Samu has just opened a wrestling gym in Pensacola but will continue to work ECW. Brian Pillman didn't appear at the Deer Park show as was the original plan. He had backed out of it several weeks ago after suffering an ankle infection, which required surgery, which has caused him to be hooked up to in for the past few weeks which is why he had the big patch on his arm doing the WWF stuff at TV. July 12th Allentown lineup is Falls Count Anywhere with Gordy and Dreamer vs. Raven and Lee Jericho defending TV title against Shane Douglas, ECW tag titles with Eliminators vs. Gangsters, 2 Cold Scorpio vs. Pitbull No. 2, Sandman vs. Blue Dust and Todd Gordon vs. Bill Alfonso. Here and there. A shoot promotion called Future Fights debuted on June 29th in Honolulu drawing 3,500 fans. Lions Den fighters Jerry Bolander, UFC 8 semi-finalist, and Tri Teligman, of Dallas, captured the light heavyweight 168 to 199 pounds, and heavyweight tournaments respectively, while Jay Palmer won the middleweight, 168 and less, division. Since they were on the way back from the Pancrase show the previous Tuesday, among those at the show were Ken Shamrock, Frank Shamrock, Amesder and Vernon White and also appearing at the show were Toru Tanaka and Helsinki Gracie. Ken Shamrock addressed the crowd before the show thanking them for supporting events like this and saying they need to have more sports events like this to show politicians these are hard training athletes competing in a clean sport. The matches were under free fight rules inside a 24 by 24 boxing ring. A correction from the Dick Murdoch bio from two weeks away. Murdoch actually did spend a brief period of time in the Marine Reserves as a private as one of our readers served with him. Craig Peters, who had worked as an editor and writer for Pro Wrestling Illustrated and its sister after Mags for the past 15 years, will be leaving at the end of the month to work doing programs, booklets and running online services for Ringling Brothers Circus. Peters, who did the majority of the work on the Pro Wrestling Almanac which is currently on the newsstands, time permitting, he may still have his hand involved in the magazines to a small degree. UFC it was believed that over the past week that Bob Marowitz struck a deal in Rhode Island to clear the final obstacle to have the UFC put on, but as of press time on July 2 just 10 days prior to the event, tickets were still not yet on sale nor was the event confirmed for the Providence Civic Center so the deal must not have been completed. There was a local newspaper story that Marowitz had agreed to make knee and elbow blows illegal in exchange for getting clearance. There is some kind of controversy about fighting inside a cage, but since the judge ruled that the UFC needs to be governed by the same state guidelines as pro wrestling, go figure. The fact was that there have been cage matches in the past in Rhode Island. Goal of the Year award goes to New York State Senator Roy Goodman. Goodman sponsored legislation, which just passed the New York State Senate, to regulate UFC-type matches. Last year Goodman was very public in his part in getting the human cockfight, you know EFC, banned from an arena in Brooklyn and they basically had to move the pay-per-view to a secret location in North Carolina at the last minute. Goodman's bill, which in his words, will put an end to the unbridled human cockfighting which can seriously injure contestants and which sets a terrible example to our youth, would legally allow UFC and EFC to regularly promote in New York State and his rule changes put into the bill were basically all the same rules, except mandating time limits of no more than 20 minutes which I'm sure that after the 30-minute televised fiascos of the past, that Semaphore Entertainment Group wrote themselves, that UFC already had. The only difference between the human cockfights of the past and the regulated pure sport that Goodman talked about creating is that the state gets its 5%, the same guy who overreacted with all the inflamed rhetoric is the one to sponsor the bill to bring it in, so long as the state gets its cut, and then sends out press releases talking about the rule changes he's created, all of which were basically the rules of the sport going in. And in USA Today this week, they listed John McCain as one of Bob Dole's top four choices for vice president. WCW The third member of the heel team for the pay-per-view won't be announced until the night of the show. Speculation is running rampant about who it is. I've been told that the deal was finalized last week for whomever it is. My feeling is that it's Hulk Hogan because a reader was working on the set of the movie Hogan is doing with Roddy Piper and said that Hogan told Piper he was asked to be the third guy and that he probably was going to do it. 
it wouldn't be a disappointment like most mystery partners turn out to be, and it would be the best thing for Hogan's career in some ways although there is a legit risk that the heel Hulk Hogan won't have the same pay-per-view drawing power of the babyface version and when a guy gets 25% of the cut, he'd better have incredible drawing power or he's not worth it. Nitro on July 1st from the US Air Arena in Landover, Maryland, estimated 7,000 fans, about 4,000 paying $60,000, was good in the sense that it built interest in the pay-per-view because of the Kevin Nash, who was called Kevin Nash by Eric Bischoff, and Scott Hall, who was still never identified but did still speak with a Spanish accent, angles. They came out at the beginning of the second hour through the crowd to huge babyface reactions and sat in the front row eating popcorn. Then, while a video of Rey Mysterio Jr. was playing, they interrupted it and got on the house mic with tons of security and WCW both faces and heels coming out. Aside from the fact that Nash is funny as hell, the other reasons, aside from the fact they are going to get cheered no matter what and it really doesn't matter who gets cheered as long as people buy tickets to see the match, another reason the guys are getting cheered is that in every confrontation, it's two guys standing up to like 20 people, half of whom have guns, and they never back down. Later in the show they aired a segment with the police escorting Hall and Nash to their car, Nash was on a roll mocking the cops, complaining about his bad knees, saying that if all the cops pulled all their paychecks, couldn't afford a car like the one he was getting in, talking about treating the cops to donuts, etc. As far as the rest of the show went, it was better than the previous week, but not by much. It opened with a two and a half stars match with Harlem Heat keeping the tag titles beating Steiners in 1049 when Rob Parker showed up as Heat's new manager and hit Rick, who was on the top rope, with his cane, to lead to Booker T scoring the pin. The finale saw the four horsemen beat Joe Gomez and Renegade and Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson in 1151. Due mainly to Benoit being ferocious, the match was very good but the finish was one of the funniest on record. Renegade was on the top rope and it appeared they were going to do the same exact finish as in the opener, this time with Steve McMichael using the briefcase. However, Renegade either lost his balance or simply jumped off the top because McMichael was slow in getting in position. McMichael trying to make the angle work, once Renegade took off, threw the briefcase in the direction of Renegade still trying to save the finish, but missed him by a mile. Amidst all the confusion, Flair put Renegade in the figure four for the win. In between were four bad matches. Disco Inferno beat Kurosawa in 3.45 when an older man came out as a second Disco Inferno, distracted Kurosawa, who played face believe it or not, and Disco hit him with the Disco Ball for the pin. It looked even worse than it sounds. Dallas Page beat Scotty Riggs in 5.42 with the Diamond Cutter. Typical Page stuff where both guys work hard. But they didn't get heat and a lot of the work looked lame. Randy Savage and Greg Valentine was even funnier. Since they were running out of time, you could hear the ref give them a 30-second cue and they were nowhere close to going home. So Valentine did a back suplex and then laid there like he had knocked himself out so Savage could deliver the elbow for the pin. Needless to say, Greg didn't look good. And the worst of the bunch was Giant over John Tenna in 637 in a near-worst match of the year caliber match. After the match, Bubba did a run-in and shaved off half of Tenta's beard. One can safely say WCW has tremendous Monday night momentum and that to this point even though the shows haven't all been good, the two-hour format is a huge ratings success which can be attributed to the two-hour show getting the jump on Raw which is a huge advantage, but Kevin Nash and Scott Hall are a big part in it as well because of the huge replay numbers. For July 1st, WCW did a 3.3 rating and 6.2 share, 3.0 the first hour, 3.6 the second hour, to Raw's 2.6 and 4.5. The replay hours were 1.5 and 1.8 totaling a 1.7 rating and 4.3 share which is another record. WCW Saturday Night did a 2.1 and Pro a 1.4 over the weekend. Glacier was at the licensing fair and was told his costume didn't look as good in person as on the videos. He was said to look like Chris Champion although others have told me he's a guy who has never wrestled before that they are training at the camp. Others have said it's going to be a futuristic martial arts team. Why do I have this vision of Van Hammer banging his head going through my brain? Speaking of Nash, his first son, Tristan Dakota Nash, was born on June 13th. For the week ending June 16th, total viewership for all WCW programming was 5.73 million homes on 180 stations compared with 4.01 million homes on 153 stations for WWF. WWF. Christine Rosati one of the three overweight women who were put on the old TNT show in bathing suits and the butt of Bobby Heenan jokes, passed away on June 27 from the Eagley virus at the age of 47. She had been hospitalized for several days, with them believing she was suffering from kidney stones.
Rosati and sisters Vivian and Diane were lifelong WWF fans out of Hopewell Junction, New York, and used to hold up signs at the early Raw tapings. Complete international incident pay-per-view lineup from July 21st in Vancouver is the six-man main event, Undertaker vs. Goldust, Mankind vs. Jake Roberts, Steve Austin vs. Mark Marrow and Smoking Guns vs. Body Donna's non-title. If there is a Justin Bradshaw vs. Savio Vega match, and they did an angle for it at the Raw tapings, it would be on the pregame show. From the Superstars tapings on June 25th in La Crosse, Wisconsin before 3,523 paying $45,786 saw several debuts. Tom Brandy aka Johnny Gunn debuted as Salvatore Sincerely, coming out to Italian entrance music doing a gimmick where he tells the fans how much he likes them but it's insincere, similar to the Rojos being from America gimmick years back. Tracy Smothers debuted as Freddie Joe Floyd from Bull Eggs, Oklahoma, and is already feuding with Justin Bradshaw over the Texas-Oklahoma rivalry. Smothers won the first match, but Bradshaw beat him in a rematch. There is actually an interesting story about the name and gimmick. Bull Eggs, OK is a real place and it is the small town where Jack and Jerry Briscoe grew up before moving to Blackwell, Oklahoma. Jack Briscoe's given name is Fred Joe Briscoe, while Jerry's is Floyd Gerald Briscoe. T.L. Hopper, Tony Anthony, got a win over Duke Drossy. He comes out to entrance music that sounds like a toilet flushing and brings his favorite toilet plunger, which he calls Betsy, to the ring with it and kisses the plunger after wins and grinds it into his foes' faces. He's doing a total hick plumber gimmick, as if WWF doesn't already have enough hick type characters. Alex Porto debuted as Alex the Pug Porto, doing an amateur wrestler gimmick. Bill Irwin debuted as the goon, doing a hockey player gimmick with hockey organ music coming to the ring. Jim Neidhart debuted as who? From who knows where? Wearing an assassin mask. Since he did a job for Savio Vega in his debut, who knows what plans are in store for him? Also at the taping, Brian Pillman came out doing the Bushwhackers march with the Bushwhackers, pretending to have turned face, but then hit Luke with his crutch. Austin is getting the mega push, refusing to wrestle Aldo Montoya and later Sonny Rogers, actually this was to give him time off because of his lip injury, giving them both forfeit wins, and then beating them both up after they were awarded the win. They did an angle where Sonny called out Phineas to apologize to him, and she ended up slapping him when she told him she was going to kiss him. It ended with Phineas slopping her. In a Mero TV win over Hunter Hearst Helmsley, another job? Marlena gave Sable a present and Mero was so mad he slapped it out of her hand. WWF sent Mero and Sable, Undertaker and Paul Bearer and Shawn Michaels and Sonny to the New York licensing fair and had a full-blown media packet complete with a complimentary videotape and lots of space. WCW had a small bit of space as part of the Turner booth and had a one-page piece of paper to hand out. Randy Savage and Glacier were there. When people asked who Glacier was, the TBS execs who had no idea just said he was one of our biggest and most popular stars. Needless to say which group made the better impression, particularly since they were sending Sunny around the place in her cowgirl outfit and execs were following her into the booth. WWF mag ripped Kevin Nash for leaving for the money. Skip and Sunny are officially engaged after being together for the past six years. Other house shows this past week saw Madison, Wisconsin on June 26 draw $2,333 and $34,697, Louisville on June 27 drew $3,256 and $51,908. Indianapolis on June 28 drew $5,501 and $90,550. Detroit on June 29 drew $5,930 and $102,822. And Pittsburgh on June 30 drew $6,264 and $111,738. Detroit and Indy were the best gates for regular house shows in six and five years respectively. The wrestlers had lots of problems due to either a flight delay or cancellation getting into Louisville from Madison, so Aldo Montoya and Duke Drossi had to stall about 45 minutes, doing one match which Drossi won by turning heel, then a second match which Montoya won, before the crew sans Jim Helwig finally arrived. In Indianapolis, they announced a October 20th in your house date and put tickets on sale at the show and they went quickly. Barry Windham had a meeting with Vince McMahon this past week. He was said to have been around 275 pounds, maybe 20 pounds overweight, and was interested in making a comeback at the age of 36. It looks pretty good that he'll be coming in. Maybe they can team him with Dustin Rhodes as Silverdust. Ron Simmons is expected to debut at the next tapings as Sonny's single star with a huge push.
Jim Cornette went on the road and got leg dropped by Yokozuna after Yokozuna lost to Bulldog in Detroit and was carried out by Bulldog, who kept dropping him on purpose and accidentally knocking his head into one thing or another while dragging him out after dropping him. Reports from both Indy and Detroit were that the crowd reactions were super up and down the show, far greater than at Titan shows in the past where only the top guys got big reactions. Michaels in particular is getting a rock star reaction from teenagers. Cornette isn't managing rockers, he just came out on Raw with Marty Jannetty because it fit into a storyline. They already shot an angle for Sid vs. Vader when they returned to Detroit. Also in both Detroit and Pittsburgh in the Michaels vs. Vader matches, they had Goldust interfere, which led to Johnson, Bulldog, Owen Hart and finally Sid cleaning house on everyone, to set up Michaels Goldust matches at the next show in both cities. Bart Gunn missed a few shows this weekend because of a family emergency. In those cities, Phineas beat Billy in singles matches. Steve Austin missed all the shows after television. He had to miss the shows because his upper lip was mangled, apparently from a kick to the face by Marrow at King of the Ring which was reopened in the Jake Roberts match. He worked the first night of TV, and the second night they did the gimmick where he didn't work matches. He consulted with a plastic surgeon and I don't believe he's going to need plastic surgery to repair the damage. But they wanted him out of the ring until July 5th. Weekend ratings saw Action Zone do a 2.0 and Mania a 1.3. Bret Hart will wrestle on the South Africa tour in September, but there is no firm date on when he'll return stateside. This is the end of this conversion. Be sure to comment and subscribe. See you next time.